A little context, my character is ace and does not drink for reasons in his backstory. The DM and all the table knew that. This story was in my first campaign, and the group was fairly new to this. We had just finished a dungeon, and we had began preparing to avenge a companion that was murdered by a powerful vampire. My DM, who had already had problems with me, decided that we should celebrate our last victory in a bar. We were fine with that, as it was something we always did. The thing is that he told us that we all got drunk and started and... Are you kidding me? When we tried to tell him we did not want that, he became pissed and told us that this is what happened and we just had to deal with it. Some sessions later, he decided to stop the campaign entirely, which was sad because we really liked our characters and their interactions. I'm assuming we liked our characters and our interactions is excluding the bit about the you-know-what. Why DMs do this? I have no idea, but I mean, I guess the DM shot his shot and it, um, it missed. It very much missed. Here's a story about the last group I DM'd for in Dungeons and Dragons, and maybe the last one I'll ever DM for. So I am a longtime DM for multiple games and rule sets. I am also a big fan of gothic horror themes and settings. When the Ravenloft book came out for D&D 5th edition, I was excited to run a homebrewed game set in my very own Domain of Dread. I put an ad out and received an application from an already formed group looking for a game through Discord. What luck! The setting was a mysterious island covered in fog, fighting a losing war against monsters, where the party would be the equivalent of paid hunters. From there, I had planned that as they explored and found new towns, they'd learn more and more about the island and uncover the truth about the monsters. We didn't even get to the second city. It started off well with the party getting a basic contract to hunt down an undead with a mentor. I even put a fun assortment of bounties for larger boss-like creatures, which I thought would be a good side quest material while they explored the island. The party did the normal paranoid D&D behavior of insight checking every being they met and checking everything for traps and or curses. Strangely, they trusted when NPCs told them the mist was toxic and they needed to keep buying candles to ward it away. This was a lie and was meant to lead to the next part of the story, but oh well. The only real issues in these sessions were little ones, such as how the party really only did those bounties, which is something I probably should have thought about ahead of time. They also, on multiple occasions, killed innocents when they failed a check relating to them, i.e. killing a fellow hunter after failing a persuasion check because the hunter would not give them something for free. One character even had a 20-page backstory complete with a family history and insisted I somehow memorize it all. This led to frequent situations like, me, you receive a letter from your Uncle Bill. Them, I don't have an Uncle Bill. Me, in your backstory, you mention an Uncle Bill. I don't have an Uncle Bill. Cue five minute break where I have to review his backstory. You mention your uncle here. Oh, that's Uncle Phil, not Bill. They had at least like a hundred relatives. The worst issue up until the incident was when someone would complain that something bad happened to their character. I like to do situational style combat, things that require different strategies in combat to make each encounter unique, like alternating heights and terrain, stuff like that. Think XCOM's sit rep system. If anything negative happened to the party or a specific party member, the next 10 minutes were spent arguing rules. Rule zero meant nothing, I guess. While these aspects of the game were annoying, it wasn't enough to make me rage quit as the game was still more fun than it was stressful. What did make me blow up was the incident. After six months of story derailment, I felt we needed to at least move past the starting city. So I made an encounter which saw the party encounter the remaining soldiers of an army holding out against the undead. Upon assisting, the group finds out the duke of this land is acting as general and needs the party's help. He even drafted the party into the ranks of the army as a show of force. Railroady, I know, but at this point, I just wanted them to do something. Something, anything in the main story. The party insulted and then fought with him instead. Now I had a plan in mind for this event, if it happened, even if they TPK'd, which they did. What I did not have a plan for was the ensuing argument where the party got mad I gave them an unbalanced encounter. They picked a fight with the Duke and his personal army. It wasn't meant to be a fight, but it became one because you made it a fight. 
I blew up at them because all they seemed to do was murder anyone who says no to them or otherwise doesn't bend over backwards for them. Earlier that same session, they killed someone for playing a prank on them. I ended the session with a scene of the army taking the party prisoner, which the next session would be them breaking out and taking out this duke, since that's clearly what they wanted. That was until one of the players starts complaining about all this again and ends with, well, I'm just gonna kill every NPC from now on, screw all of them. I just left the call and typed out what I was feeling when I was more clear-headed rather than try to vocalize it when I was still consumed by anger. The next week's session was cancelled due to a wedding I was involved in. I thought that would be a good time to cool down and find ways to patch this up. The day of the wedding, the guy who had talked about killing all NPCs last session posts on the Discord about how this clearly isn't the game for him and a bunch of negativity against me before leaving. Another player who was playing a paladin reached out to me and wanted to talk. This guy was the only one who vocalized any issues throughout the game, and he is the only one I'll hold no feelings after the fact about. He wanted to patch things up and continue the game because it had been six months and this was the only negative incident from their perspective, or so I thought. It turns out that the party had a separate discord, which I was not in, where they complained about me and my DM choices, and even my personal life? After hearing all the things they had talked about regarding me, I felt worse mentally than I had in a long time. Obviously the game was over after that, and didn't touch anything TTRPG related for many months. It might sound stupid, but it was something I talked about in therapy for a while because of how hurt I was. Now almost a year ago since that game, I am finally enjoying D&D again, as a player, with an amazing DM. But I do not ever see myself being a DM again, not for D&D at least. Players, your DM is human, like you. Please treat them so. Your DM is absolutely human, and their fun in the game matters as well. Look, if you have issues with the game, you tell your DM about it. Opening up a separate Discord is not going to solve your D&D problems. Just talking smack about your DM behind their back while they're still running your game for you isn't going to make the game any better, but I'm pretty sure most of you already know that. As a dungeon master, I totally understand why this guy would be turned off of DMing. This sucks. It's not the worst horror story that I've ever read about, but it's definitely one that I can definitely relate to thinking about. Many DMs feel sort of imposter syndrome, and seeing those feelings get validated by your players is probably one of the worst things that could realistically happen to you as a dungeon master. Players out there, remember, your DM is not some monolithic entity that players keep in their closet and then take out whenever they want to play D&D. The DM is also a person who wants to have a good time. If you have problems with your game, obviously bring them up, but... Not like this, guys. This is a shorter story about a player I had in a campaign I run. I will name him Yardem, and this one is one of many stories I have about this guy. The crux of the issue is that Yardem kept trying to inject overpowered homebrew into the campaign and would get upset when I would tell him he couldn't do it. He had this familiar robot spider that he also used as a spiritual weapon. I have no inherent issue with this, and for the most part, there were no issues, until a certain combat encounter presented itself where he was doing a lot of damage with his familiar. Yardem had initially summoned the spider as a spiritual weapon, but then started casting spells through it. The spider was just ripping into enemies, rolling consistently high damage with Yardem casting spells through it as a familiar. As a result of this, I rolled that one of the enemies got really annoyed and aimed at the spider. Yardem then told me that I couldn't target the spider since it was a spiritual weapon. Wait, can't you hit spiritual weapons? I did it all the time in my game. Oh. Uh... Sorry, Sophia, that's my bad. I explained to Yardem that sure, he had initially summoned the spider as a spiritual weapon, but I pointed out that he had been using it mostly as a familiar as he was casting spells through it. That meant that it was currently a familiar and could be targeted. I then explained that if you're using your familiar slash spiritual weapon and you can use it to cast spells, in that round it's currently a familiar and can be targeted. This would not end its function as a spiritual weapon, but it wouldn't be able to function as a familiar until you go through the standard process of resummoning it. Yardem apparently was not okay with this and accused me of going out of my way to completely nerf his character. I responded telling him, I'm not nerfing his character, I'm just not going to allow a player to have an immortal, invulnerable familiar that he can use to give the help action and cast spells through because that, that is overpowered. 
he pouted for the rest of the session and afterwards made some really passive aggressive comments about how controlling I am. I just rolled my eyes at him and this was the beginning of the end for him. He eventually rage quit out of the campaign mid combat because he failed a concentration check on a spell. TLDR, player pouts and accuses me of completely nerfing his character because I won't let him have an immortal, invulnerable familiar. The DM here made a pretty reasonable ruling. This guy can't have a familiar that is completely immortal to cast spells willy-nilly and ruin the game's combat. That would be bad for not only the DM, but for the party as well. Having one OP character isn't fun for everyone else. Of course, I think that players and DMs should have discussions about stuff like this, but at the end of the day, the DM gets the ruling. Unless the ruling is going to ruin the game for all the players, then the ruling stands. Now, discussion should be had, but during the game is not the time for said discussion and throwing a tantrum and pouting about it, definitely not the best way to respond. So first, some quick context. There were four of us, including the DM. We were playing in a play-by-post gritty realism game. I was playing a cleric, my friend was playing a rogue, and the other player was a barbarian. This next bit is super important. Both the barbarian and myself were playing Vumans, variant humans. My idea was to be a combat medic, so I was playing a war cleric with the healer feet. The barbarian was, well, a barbarian, so he took great weapon master. Again, for emphasis, I was effectively a field doctor and the barbarian was a tank with a great axe that could occasionally split people in two. Oh, and we're all level three. So the true beginning of the issue starts a little ways before it. We're traveling together when we find a giant village. They let us in and I offer my services as a healer to make some money on the side, and the barbarian opts to come along. Miraculously, this thriving giant village doesn't have a doctor, so they have quite a few people sick, hurt, and or dying. And at the same time, some of these medical procedures require more than one set of hands. So. I enlist the Barbarian as my nurse slash assistant. So I do some medicine checks and heal some giants. Then a serious issue comes up. My check reveals that the giant's lung has been perforated and is filling up with blood and fluid from his body cavity. Now, I don't have the equipment to deal with this kind of injury, but I do know a slipshod treatment that will suffice until they can get him to a bigger town. Now you might be asking, OP, why aren't you using magic to heal these giants? Well, I'll tell you. See, the reason was twofold. The first fold was that since this was gritty realism, a short rest was eight hours, and the long rest was a week. So being a third level cleric, I did not have the spell slots to be healing willy-nilly, hence the healer feat. The second fold was that the DM, in the spirit of gritty realism, said the low magic, like cure wounds and healing word, were more akin to stitches and patching up. They could heal shallow wounds to the point of no longer needing to worry about infection, but they could still not heal a grievous injury, remember that. So the holdover treatment for this giant's injury is basically making a puncture wound all the way through his skin and lung, then putting a tube into the lung to drain the liquid and hope that his lung didn't collapse while they moved him to a big city healer. A procedure that needs multiple hands, so I figured I'd do the important part and be the one that shoved the tubes inside the wound, and the barbarian would be the one to make the incision. The DM made the barbarian roll a medicine check. Pretty normal. He rolls a two. A two, not a one, a two. So logically, the DM has the barbarian stab the giant to death in front of all the gods and everyone. So now we're arrested, all of our stuff is taken, and we're on trial for murder. But it isn't so much a trial as it is the giants being like, you killed our guy, now we're gonna kill you. Luckily, our rogue is able to just barely convince them to simply kick us out of the village with a nat 20, not an exaggeration by the way, so they kick us out of the village with literally only the clothes on our backs. We're stuck in the middle of the woods with almost no equipment, and we need to survive, and oh yeah, it's the dead of winter, so we do our best camping, and despite average rolls, the DM isn't really giving much. Then one day, we stumble across what the DM says is obviously a bandit hideout, so we all collectively think, Awesome. We can check to see how many people are there and maybe get some equipment. So we managed to sneak up to the hideout and it appears that there are only a few bandits. Now while camping, between the three of us, we were able to forge the necessary pieces to craft a crude stone dagger and a crude stone hand axe. Basically, they just had a minus one to damage and the possibility to break on a natural one. The barbarian just found a large branch to serve as a great club. So we think if we go about it in a smart manner, we might be able to get some decent equipment and maybe even whatever loot the bandits have. 
So we attack the place, it's close, but we're able to take down some of them and pick up their weapons. Then it happened. The barbarian rolls a nat 1. Now, when we joined, we all agreed to a critical fumble table, which is why we were so shocked at the consequences of the nat 2, but also why we didn't react the way we ought to have. So the barbarian rolled a nat 1. What could happen? He breaks his weapon? He drops it? He hits one of us? He hits himself? No, the bandit he's fighting gets a free hit on him and cripples one of the barbarian's hands. Until we can have it healed, he has permanent disadvantage while using weapons with a two-handed property and enemies have advantage on disarming him from things held in that hand. And he has permanent disadvantage on athletics checks related to doing things with two hands. So the barbarian, with the great weapon master feet, now can't use great weapons. So I tried to heal his hand, the DM said that we would not be able to heal this kind of wound at our current level, and we'd have to go find a larger city and pay a cleric to heal the hand. How much? Probably about 500 gold pieces. So we'd lost almost all of our gear, we were stranded in the woods, had no money, and now we'd have to find a larger city to pay a cleric with money we didn't have. The barbarian quit on the spot, the DM was pissed off, raving that he had no clue why the Barbarian quit and that he knew it was a gritty realism game. When the rogue and I explained that maybe he quit because it seemed like we only ever got punished for interacting with the world and that he had basically crippled the Barbarian's character since we had no money to buy a heal, no equipment to make money, and no people to take jobs from, maybe the Barbarian just decided to call it quits. So the DM nuked the whole server. As an afternote, this wasn't the only instance of something like this happening, just the most egregious. As with many like DMs, it really seemed like the DM equated gritty realism with everyone is an asshole and only bad things happen. Low rolls punished us harshly, while high rolls were diminished. Nat 20s didn't do much, usually letting us only partially succeed, but if you rolled a 5 and below, it was treated as a critical failure, and extremely bad things happened. TLDR, DM thinks gritty realism means everything sucks, cripples PC, gets confused when they quit, then nukes the server when remaining players explain that everything sucking isn't fun. I know there are games out there with gritty realism that have a lot of fun, and I'll explain why. Gritty realism makes games usually more difficult, and therefore more rewarding when the players succeed through clever planning, lucky dice rolls, etc, etc, etc. A big part of many gritty realism games is that more satisfying success. However, if your players never succeed, then there's really no point. The whole point of the realism is to make things more gratifying when things work out. And if things, again, never work out, then there is literally no point. Or at the very least, a major part of the point is lost. I don't understand what this DM gets out of this game. I mean, clearly the players aren't having a good time, and as a dungeon master, if my players aren't having fun, there is no way in hell I'm having fun. Look, of course, players don't need to succeed at everything. That is just going to be the case in probably every D&D game, or TTRPG in general. There has to be some failure, but failure to this degree, well, it's a bit much. Recently I, female, 21, was invited to a D&D campaign with my boyfriend by our mutual friend. The dungeon master was a stranger, and so were the two other players. For the sake of anonymity, I will address the people in this campaign as follows. Cleric, Warlock, Rogue, Ranger, my boyfriend, and myself. Oh, yeah, the DM too. After going through ideas, myself and my boyfriend settled on our characters and we made our sheets. I chose to play an artificer alchemist half-elf and my boyfriend settled on a Kalishtar Horizon Walker Ranger. We presented our sheets to the DM, got introduced to Cleric, Warlock wasn't there yet, and started our first session. A burned down tavern or two later, we ended the first session on a good note. The next session starts and we get immediately arrested, understandably so. The party gets split up, seemingly randomly, two below ground, cleric and ranger, and two above ground, rogue and myself. Rogue and me figure that the other two are in danger. After some searching, we find the well in which the other two are in, the session ends there, and we feel pretty excited for the next one. The next session starts with my character having an in-character breakdown in front of the well while waiting for Rogue to come back with the others. Due to a telepathic link Rogue set up this morning as we were getting arrested, I found out that the party need my help, so I want to go down and help them, but the guards that were previously chilling with me, singing songs and dancing, started being hostile towards me for seemingly no reason. I was trying to get away, so I asked the DM if there is another way down the well, because previously he said that Rogue and some guards went down a different entrance of the well. The DM said to me, that there was no other entrance, so I said, 
I want to go down the well? I thought that I heard him wrong, and the rogue slid down a chain or something in the well. He, however, had a different plan in mind. The DM proclaimed that I jump down the well. Okay, after making my character jump down, the DM said he felt bad because he didn't explain it well enough. And that, in fact, there was a chain I could just use to go down the well. At this point, I was already falling, so I tried to break my fall, grab the chain, which made me take even more than just falling damage, even though I succeeded my dex check, I found myself prone at the bottom of the well. Still alive though. The guards were trying to shoot me from atop the well, which was 80 feet deep. I thought I had a better chance at survival since I was prone and not in melee range, which should make them have a disadvantage. Oh, how foolish I was. The DM proclaimed that it was auto-hit and rolled the dice just to see if it was a crit. Guess what? It was. I was left on three hit points. The DM invited me to a private voice channel since the other players were protesting the auto-hit. After joining the private chat, I cast Sanctuary to give me a better advantage, and the DM started rolling against my spell DC. One of the guards failed and was supposed to pick another target as per the spell's description, but the second one succeeded with, guess what, another nat 20. It however didn't matter because the fail never meant anything at all. The DM never targeted anyone other than me, and I ended up getting hit for one damage, and the nat 20 made it two. One hit point left. Still good, right? I am still... Somehow alive? Wrong. I was told to roll death saving throws. After two fails and one save, I rolled a nat 20 and should have been brought to one hit point. I mean, I should have been on one hit point in the first place, but anyway. I fell unconscious though, which means I dropped to zero hit points? A body hijacking slug crawled into my character's mouth in the water that wasn't there when the rogue went in. Before I came back to the group voice chat, I was told that my character would have no memory of this and I should just player as normal. I was thinking, okay, we will find a cure for it to the next session or something, right? Oh boy. My boyfriend Ranger tried identifying the enemies. He got attacked by the same slugs, using primeval awareness to check the type. The DM said he sensed the presence of the slugs, but it wasn't any creature type from the list of the feature. My boyfriend also tried using protection for evil and good to avoid being possessed, but was informed that it doesn't count as possession. After trying to make the slugs his favorite enemy, he had to suggest a name for the type of creature they were, since the DM said they don't have a type at all. Keep in mind, the whole campaign was centered around the slugs. After we ended the session by going to a tavern for a well-needed long rest, we waited for the next session for three weeks due to some difficulties and football. We come back and we are almost instantly called into this epic battle for the DM. It took us four hours of IRL time to finish four rounds of combat, after which we realized that it was unwinnable. Unused parts of the map suddenly became used as soon as Ranger, Cleric, and Warlock made a plan that included that part of the map. Once we realized we can focus on the bigger enemies and use their death explosions, mind you, the bigger enemies had three attacks, acid spit, and explosion on death, but never moved, to deal with the hordes, the baddies use bonus action dig, basically just surrounding our Ranger and Cleric away from the hordes. We were forced to retreat and get a long rest, but the DM once again had other plans. The slug I thought I would get rid of and survive, well, it ate your insides, broke your bones, and made you vomit your guts out. Essentially killing me on the spot. No saves, no checks, just a character I poured two months into, dead. There were many other moments where the DM didn't give us any choice about our actions, but for the sake of time, I decided to mention only the most messed up ones. We also didn't gain a single item in this campaign, not even a penny. TLDR, DM forced my player character's death, never gave out rewards, railroaded and power gamed just a little too hard. I don't know if I'd call it power gaming, as you're the dungeon master, you can kind of do whatever you want, so power gaming doesn't really mean much, but whatever the case, this is absolutely a hostile dungeon master. What the reasoning behind this is, I will never understand. A hostile DM is somebody who goes out of their way to just kill or harm player characters. I mean, look at this situation. It is absolutely ridiculous. The OP at the beginning is trying to help her party out of a pretty mundane situation. Standard run-of-the-mill prison break out of a well. And the DM makes it absurdly difficult for no apparent reason. Now, things shouldn't come easy in Dungeons & Dragons. There should be some difficulty. But difficulty to this degree, it feels ridiculous. It feels like the dungeon master just simply doesn't want you to succeed at all. And when the master of this world doesn't want you to succeed, it makes everything feel artificial, it makes everything feel fake. 
top that off with a spontaneous slug death after a BS combat, then, well, you have a recipe for disaster. And that is where we are going to end today's episode of RPG Horror Stories. If you guys did enjoy it, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of my content, then please do check out our Q and Play series where I answer your questions in a rambly, unscripted format. And while you're there in the cards, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content right as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own stories or thoughts, go down into the comments down below. If you can't think of a comment, leave the comment slug death to let me know you made it to the end of the video. In essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell.